Hello, my name is Andy Catto and I am Vice Chair of the City of London Guide Lecturers Association. This is the second of a short series of videos focused on helping people develop their lecturing or presentation skills. Last time, if you saw that uh, video, Please, if you haven't looked at it, you'll find it under the uh, Cato Walks heading in uh, YouTube. I focused mainly on the paralinguistics, the decoration that we put around the words that we use. This time I want to add just a little bit more about that and then talk a bit more about the body language that we use, which dramatically either helps or hinders the impact that we want to make on our audience. I often said that everybody is bilingual. We have our natural language and then we have a body language. And it's certainly very important in determining how effective you are as a lecturer. But first, a couple more words about the voice. First of all, taking care of your voice. It's not an uncommon situation to find yourself a little bit nervous when you're delivering a lecture and one of the physical effects of that feeling a bit nervous a bit under threat is that uh, the primitive bit of your brain at the back here can stimulate something called the fight or flight reaction which can have lots of physical effects including almost like shutting down your digestive system it is not needed if like, your primitive ancestor was fighting a saber-toothed tiger, for example. So what you might find is your mouth, your throat, goes a bit dry. So sip water, have it easily to hand. And I have to say, taking a sip of water can also give you an, a chance to take a bit of a, a breath and to reflect and catch your drift again, if you see what I mean. Another thing that's sometimes mentioned particularly by some actors is to be careful of taking in any dairy products before you go well in their case on stage without to do a lecture so milky tea chocolate cheese the thinking is that it can coat the vocal cords in mucus uh, which doesn't help for clarity of diction so something maybe to watch out for I have to say, some of the same people also recommend taking a small nip, a little sip of port before you again go on stage or whatever. I'm not necessarily recommending that, but it's a it's a thought. So take care of your voice, this basic instrument that we have, this raw material, and how we play that instrument can really affect our impact. For example, the pitch the inflection that we put in what we say just for an example this is like the musical notation if you like going up up or down so if i was to say that um, the words would be simple words this was a very important time in british history and if i was to say them like this this was a very important time in british history or this was a very important time in British history. You can hear the difference. First time sounds a bit like a question. Second time, a more definite proposal. So be thoughtful about getting the pitch. If I'm going to ask a question to an audience, maybe a rhetorical question, goes up. If you want to make a statement, you want to be taken seriously, go down at the end. And volume. I mentioned volume last time. So in my experience, most people could speak a little bit louder. And I mentioned doing the word ho. Another one you can uh, word is to use um, that word in a more a physical way. The H sound is a quite a gentle plosive consonant. And what you can do is think to yourself, oh, it's a scale of one to ten. One being really, really quiet and ten being really loud. You can almost set yourself a target of distance that you want the sound to travel. One being maybe a few inches and being several feet several yards 
and it is recommended if you really want to work at getting your volume to increase what you can do is add some physicality to the saying that ho by doing like an underarm bowl or a golf swing it can really increase the volume so look, a quick demonstration might be that if I want to say uh, maybe a level four and I get my underarm bowling I go ho like that I want to do a very quiet one ho really loud ho you can project you can dominate your audience not too much but being able to move from maybe a a two to a seven back to a three whatever really increases the variety that you have and another thing to think about is adding variety of emphasis of articulation and the like I mentioned the word color last time and certain consonants need to be really emphasized when we are speaking you may remember having done something when you were a child of things like Peter Piper picked pick of pick a peck of pickled peppers easy for me to say you might say I've got a few of those here which you might want to try out that I just read them through here um, in Aberdeen they're keen on meat that's lean ten men set out to get to the top of Ben Nevis you can see that it's encouraging you to really articulate and to be careful and precise about how you enunciate a man sat on a black cat. The bird heard the word. The cook saw the wolf and shook with fear. Tom's got a lot of dots on his shirt. Aunt Martha lives near Marble Arch. James hates people taking his name in vain. John Brown's been to town. And pure beer must mature, said the brewer. So have some fun with those. You can probably make up your own as, as well. Then a little bit about body language. So remember the posture, the sky hook, lowering yourself down so that your weight is mainly on the balls of your feet and that your feet are maybe sort of hip distance apart, well balanced. Helping tension maybe by rolling the shoulders, warming up those shoulders also helps with the vocal cords. And then when you're seeing an audience for the first time, first impressions as we know are vital. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And smiling is tremendous, adds warmth to your presence, adds warmth to your language the way you say things and it also uses less muscles in the face than a frown and it helps you relax now it's got to be appropriate depending on the topic that you're talking about and also you don't want to be doing a fixed smile <laughs> all the way through false that's not going to come across but a gentle warm natural smile goes a long way and eyes, the eye contact. Now there are cultural differences here, I'm aware of that. For some cultures you show respect by not making eye contact, by looking down. Typically though when you're lecturing, we need to be able to look at the audience. Small audience, well illuminated, then you can see individual people. Be careful of the lighthouse effect when the, you go from side to side doesn't come across with any um, veracity you're not making you're not making en a proper engagement with any particular member of the audience it can be quite hard if you've got a larger audience and they are in the dark you're illuminated maybe on stage you might take a tip from a great orator Barack Obama former president of the United States he would look at different parts of the audience mind you he was prompted to do that. You know, these speakers have a teleprompter scrolling up ahead of them, showing them the words. His was always carefully annotated as to when to take a breath, where to do emphasis, where to pause, but also where and about in the audience to look. They would divide a block of audience up into blocks, number them, say, look, at block two, block three, block six, whatever. And that's why he kept going like that. But engaging at a human level, making eye contact with people, can also be good news in terms of making it a human-to-human -human interaction. 
as opposed to a big lecture which can feel more threatening. And as I'm doing here, <laughs> gestures can add power. It's often said of me that if you made me sit on my hands, I would be dumb. I could not speak. We have to be careful. They add power. They can add emphasis. They can add interest for somebody to watch as long as they don't become a distraction. And that all people are seeing is your gestures. Um, the one that comes to my mind, given my age, is a TV scientist called Magnus Pike. Dr. Magnus Pike was always waving his arms around. Be careful about that sort of thing. And you might think about the sitting standing. I'm doing this mainly sitting down, which seems appropriate for this situation. But in other situations, you may need to stand up more commonly, perhaps doing a lecture. Your notes may be on a lectern and it gives you that power, it helps you breathe. Um, and there's a bit of a gradient between you and the audience. Some people say we're moving around when you're lecturing. It can help dissipate some of the tension and it can go back to that thing of being a little bit distracting. And that leads me into my final point for today's video, which is the difference between cats and dogs when it comes to communication. Now cats, well we know cats don't have owners, they have servants. They own the house they live in. They're very still, much more serene, calm, gestures, the hands, the palms tend to be downwards. And again, I mentioned him already, but the ex-president of the United States, Barack Obama, was typically a cat. You watch him on any of YouTube videos of his speeches and he may be celebrating success, but he is still very calm, very controlled, very good at the eye contact and the hands often holding the sides of the lectern. A dog, on the other hand, is friendly and gregarious, constant uh, movement, bouncy, uh, lots of gestures and movement comes to mind maybe our current uh, Prime Minister can be like that when he's communicating but again there are many examples of um, people who are effective like that look on TED for example the TED talks that we can get and it probably there's a spectrum between extreme dog maybe a Labrador coming a bit less to a poodle into the cat where you might have a, a tabby and then right extreme cat maybe Siamese it's a bit of fun and though there's some serious things around lecturing within that which are you which do you feel most comfortable which style is really you for me fairly obviously I guess it might be coming across I'm a very dog I like to move around and bounce and wave my hands about others may be much more cat what you need to be able to do is fit the style to the topic and the audience. <laughs> Silly example to finish off. If you're walking onto an aircraft, well, hopefully we will be going traveling again in this strange world, and you sit down in your seat and you hear the voice come over the intercom from the captain, probably what you want is to hear a cat. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard flight so and so to Lanzarote. My name is Captain Whatever. Whereas when the uh, cabin crew come down, quite nice for them to be, hello, welcome, what can I get you? Other way round may not be quite as suitable. So be aware, watch your natural style, practice having a go at being the other. So if you are a cat, try a little bit more gestures. You won't come across as going over the top. If you're naturally like me, dog, calm it down, be still. Practice looking at a camera, looking at an audience more calmly, serenely. See how that comes across to people. OK, well, I hope you've enjoyed and found it useful, this short session. I'll be back next week with a further one about things like handling nerves and maybe start to talk about a little about structuring our presentations. Thank you very much for listening.